Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the kind invitation, Louis, and to everybody at Aspatar. Uh, it's really been a warm welcome and a great pleasure to, to be with you and to chat to you uh, at your Tuesday morning lecture. My brief over the next three days is really to try and see how we can integrate some of the trends in concussion management in sport into Aspatar and some of the services that you deliver here. And today's lecture is really an overview of where we are from a consensus point of view in terms of man managing concussion in sport and where we've come from. And then over the next day or two, and particularly at tomorrow's lecture, we'll look into some of the clinical application uh, of these principles. So as Louis mentioned, we meet every four years as a group and, and the fifth international consensus meeting took place in Berlin in October of 2016. Uh, over 400 experts uh, and uh, a scientific uh, and organizing committee of about 30 that put together the protocols based on systemic reviews of 12 key topics in the, the field of sports concussion. And really what I'm hoping to do over the next couple of days is take those issues which were raised and will be published in about two weeks' time in a consensus, concussion consensus edition of BJSM uh, into protocols that hopefully you can integrate in your clinics here and offer your athletes uh, in terms of trying to attain the highest level of concussion care. Now, I, I often sort of sub, I give a subheading to this talk, uh, Clearing the Clutter, and it's really a play on words to say that there's so much information out there now on concussion that it sometimes becomes extremely confusing to know what we're dealing with. And also that this is very much how the concussed player often feels. Everything's going on in their heads, and I'll explain a little bit about the neurophysiology in a couple of minutes, but it's quite an erratic disarray of information going on in their heads, which is not always apparent to everybody on the outside. And that clutter is often very, very confusing to them. So as I was walking around and being introduced to the various departments yesterday, it was brought to my attention that uh, there are some areas in this clinic which also need to have some of the clutter cleared. Um, and someone thought that they might take something out of this lecture in that regard. I can't promise that, but whoever's desk this is, and, and some of you probably know, uh, clearing the clutter may, may apply there too. So where's concussion come from? So historically, it really comes from the uh, Latin word concutere, which means to shake. There's this condition which has been described over the decades, commotio cerebri, and over 3,000 years ago, ago, you can imagine the gladiators in, in Roman and Greek times certainly would have su sustained traumatic brain injury. So it's not a new injury, and one often wonders why we're making such a, a hype about it now when it's a condition that's been around for centuries, and, and we'll explain a little bit about that. But probably the person who got closest to it in ancient times was the Venetian physician Petri de Marchetti, who said that he described what he saw as a transient condition with a short duration, what he called alienation of the mind with privation of sense and motion, which really describes quite accurately what we perceive concussion to be today, and that's a functional disturbance in brain function. Uh, and we'll cover that in the coming slides. So moving on from the Venetian times to modern era, concussion is probably the hot topic in sports medicine. You cannot go onto a sports medicine website or even open uh, the pages of any sort of sports newspaper or website without seeing something related to concussion and contact and collision sports. As you're probably aware, there was also a massive lawsuit uh, against the National Football League in the United States of America, eventually settled for $1 billion uh, by retired NFL players who sued the NFL for incompetence in terms of the care of those players who'd suffered head injuries. You may not recognize this footballer, but his name is Mike Webster. Uh, and he was the subject of a movie by Will Smith, uh, which some of you may have seen, the movie Concussion, which really talks about the chronic sequelae of concussion, which has become an area of major discussion 
in uh, sports medicine and in the field of concussion management. So it's right up there, not only in the press, but in medical legal circles as well, which is one of the reasons I think it's important to have some protocols in place to be able to deal with these cases. So very kindly, Craig Tanner through Louis sent us this yesterday, and this happened just on the weekend. So this is a case of a rugby league player in Australia who sustained a concussion and uh, it was quite clear that he had a concussion and yet was allowed to play on in the game. And I'm going to see if I can get this to work. Uh, let's see if it comes on. See if I can play this video because it illustrates it quite nicely. And one. Hodgkinson. This is Elliot running towards the wing of Mason Rose. Oh, there it is. And now there's a problem for the fullback at Newcastle. It's kind of horrible. And he plays on in the game, so this is late in the game. Sutton stabs the ball in behind the defence. And Elliot dives on top of it. I simply do not understand how you say you're taking concussion seriously and that guy is allowed to stay out there without even an assessment on the first time. Okay, you've got to get this right. You have a moral duty, you have a legal duty. The game has changed. You've changed the protocol. So that's just an idea of some of the things that are happening, uh, some of the issues which are being highlighted, and the fact that it is no longer a medical issue, it's a public health issue. It's out there, that was a, a rugby commentator talking about the issue, it's a very public issue. And I think any uh, organisation which manages athletes needs to have some protocols in place to be able to protect themselves. So let's move a little bit on to this topic of concussion and if we have a look at what we're talking about, it's not the uh, area of severe brain injury that perhaps we learn about in medical school. Uh, in your case on the right hand side of the spectrum here, we're probably talking about this sort of area of the spectrum from what we might say minimal to mild brain injury. Now that may seem quite trivial but in fact it, it can make it much more difficult because it, it means it's more difficult to diagnose the symptoms and signs are more subtle and one has to really have uh, better clinical protocols to diagnose it because it's not going to show up on a, a scan as the more severe types of brain injuries might. So it is a traumatic brain injury. It's caused by a bump or blow or jolt to the head that can change the way your brain normally works. And that's really the defining feature, that there's an alteration in brain function. There probably are alterations in brain structure, but we can't really visualize them with normal imaging techniques. The head doesn't have to be hit directly for the brain to be injured, and there can be transmission of forces through whiplash or blast injuries as well. The definition of cha has changed. So if we look back in the 1970s, 1980s, there was an association with concussion and much more severe forces. In fact, up until about 2000, you weren't regarded as being concussed unless you had lost consciousness or you had amnesia. Those were the two cardinal signs. So if you didn't have either loss of consciousness or amnesia, you weren't di uh, diagnosed as being concussed. In the modern definition, there are over 20 symptoms and signs that we look for that classify concussion. And we regard the impacts as not necessarily being that high, if they, uh, but they can be significant. There was uh, a stage where concussion was synonymous with mild traumatic brain injury, but as the more serious consequences of concussion have emerged, we no ro longer regard it as mild. So we just call it a form of traumatic brain injury. There is this concept of subconcussive injury, so uh, injuries which might manifest later on but not immediately present with symptoms. It's a form of almost invisible brain injury because there's no detectable hemorrhage or, or damage that you can see on normal imaging techniques. And it results from acceleration, deceleration, rotational forces of the brain 
um, and may affect structures attached to the brain as well, such as the cranial nerves in the neck. So those linear rotational forces are probably well represented by this punch to the jaw here, which may result in a transmission of forces to the brain as well as rotation of the cranium. And that's just an illustration of the types of rotational forces. And this is one of the reasons that helmets don't offer as much protection as we would like them to, because they don't stop those rotational forces and the, and the inertia of the brain within the cranium. What happens after that is postulated to be a succession of post-concussive chain reactions, which disturb the neurophysiology uh, of the brain. So there's a significant destructive pathophysiological and biochemical response that initiates a significant chain of neurometabolic and neurochemical reactions. And that's very s significant because the changes are happening at a neurophysiological level rather than a structural level. And those physiological changes include an activation of an inflammatory response, a disturbance of ionic concentrations, an increase in excitatory amino acids, dysregulation of neurotransmitter release and synthesis, a disturbance of mitochondrial functions and energy metabolism, and the production of free radicals. It's a biomechanical injury which results in a flux of potassium and sodium ions, generation of excitatory neurotransmitters, potassium influx, an exacerbation of an efflux of potassium, depolarization, um, eventual glycolysis, and, and decreased blood flow. And these slides from our colleague uh, Bob Cantu in, in Boston illustrate this nicely. So this is a normal sort of nerve function where the signal arrives at the neuron, uh, travels down the axon to another cell, and then neurotransmitters are released in a very organized manner, triggering the next cell with a specific coded message. It's a sort of nice graphic representation of normal uh, neurophysiology. What happens during the injured state is that potassium ions rush out of the cell, Toxic calcium ions rush into the cell, leading to metabolic dysfunction. That results in an energy crisis and a massive release of neurotransmitters, which interferes with that communication across cells. And in this state, the cell becomes very vulnerable, and further injury or stress may cause cell death or serious damage. And that's why it's so important to stop playing at that stage. And it may take many days, sometimes even up to weeks, for the nerve cells to return to their normal condition, which eventually uh, it does, and then the transmission uh, comes back to the normal state. So I think one of the take-home messages from this uh, introduction is that there's a significant disturbance in the physiology of the brain. People are looking for uh, structural disturbances, and we cannot see those, but the physiological disturbances are very real. And that occurs at a microscopic, cellular, molecular, and metabolic level. Uh, but most, the good news is, resolve with time and rest. Uh, and that's, that's uh, important. So the way I often explain it to patients is that the brain and, and the nerve transmission, the brain's very much like a busy six-lane highway. So each lane will take a, carry a different sort of traffic. Some might take emotional traffic. Some might take cognitive traffic. Some may take physical traffic, uh, some may take balance and vestibular traffic, etc. And when you have a concussion, it's like an accident occurring in two or three of those lanes. So it blocks off part of the flow. And that may be more the balance and vestibular, it may be more physical, it may be cognitive, depending which lanes are obstructed. Whatever happens is if you try and carry on doing the same things you always do, it's like trying to push peak hour traffic through the remaining two or three lanes, and you get a tremendous backup of the traffic flow, and that's what it feels like to the concussed patient. So we mentioned that concussion has been around since the Roman era, so why is it so serious? Why are we all of a sudden taking this to heart and making such a fuss about it? Well, there are a few reasons, and these are some headlines just from local papers uh, in Johannesburg where I live from about seven or eight years ago, where we had three incidents of schoolboys who died as a result of their concussions either not being diagnosed or not being treated adequately. So they suffered a concussion, they played on in the, coming, in the same match or in the coming days, 
and as a result of the neurological injury they died. So that's a very, those are very extreme examples. Also important to me in this whole process and why one has to have protocols that look at function associated with the brain is that athletes lie. They all want to play, okay, there may be some big games coming up, there may be money involved, and one has to have protocols in place that objectively assess the criteria, and that's what we're going to be trying to look at in a little bit depth tomorrow. So if I had to summarize why I think concussion is serious, the first thing is it may mimic other potentially serious head injury. So those head injuries at the right hand of that spectrum I showed you where there may be significantly more structural damage and bleeds. In the beginning stages, it's difficult to tell the difference between them. But they may present uh, very similarly and they may evolve into those serious injuries and you need to detect what we call those red flags. The second is, an, is a condition called acute diffuse cerebral edema. Some people call it a second impact syndrome, which may result in significant brain injury and death. And that may have been what happened to those schoolboys. So there's diffuse edema, which occurs. Some people think it's primary. Some people argue that it's secondary to another blow after the brain's been initially injured. But that edema results in significant neurological fallout. The third reason is we're often dealing with a young cohort and they're often studying, they're learners and if, we, if they suffer a concussion it significantly affects their ability to learn. So you need processes in place that protect them and allow them to get back at optimal function to the learning environment. The other reasons are what we call a post-concussion syndrome or a lingering symptom complex. If you don't address concussion early, the symptoms can linger for weeks or even months and one has to take it seriously and get those under control because it can be a very debilitating condition affecting many aspects of their lives. The next is the hot topic of concussion at the moment and that's called CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy which is a, a neuropathological condition diagnosed post-mortem which we're going to cover at the end of this talk which can result in severe debilitation and then the last point is that concussion has now become a public health issue. And so medically, legally, you can be exposed if you don't have protocols in place. So if we look back just 15 or 17 years ago, you were only diagnosed with concussion if you lost consciousness or had amnesia. We used to classify them into grades 1, 2, and 3, and management was quite variable. So if you went to three different doctors with the same condition. One might say you can be off for a week, another would say three weeks, another would say three months. You know, some people would say never play again. It was very random as to how you were diagnosed and classified in terms of your management. So what happened as a result of, of this disparity in clinical approaches was that a group of experts got together first in 2001 they acknowledged concussion as a potentially serious injury and that as clinicians we were really found wanting in terms of objective assessment protocols and that's when the first uh, consensus meeting took place in Vienna. Subsequent to that a number of consensus meetings and statements have taken place uh, as I say uh, culminating in the fifth international conference in Berlin in 2016. What are the take-home messages from these meetings? And these are, are quite important. The first is concussion represents a serious neurological injury that may present with a wide spectrum of symptoms and signs. Previous concussion assessment protocols have been varied, subjective, and inconsistent. Serial clinical assessments, both neurological and cognitive, remain the cornerstones of management. And that's why evaluation at a clinic like this is important and re-evaluation is important. Concussion needs to be diagnosed and managed over a period of time. You cannot see the player on the side of the field there and then make a diagnosis and come to a prognosis. It, it really need, depends on how that individual responds and progresses. One thing that's changed the picture is the emergence of computerized neuropsychological or cognitive testing which has provided a useful diagnostic tool and helped us in our research. What do we mean by this? We mean that these are really almost like little computer games which give us information on how the brain is functioning and how it's changed in function. We can compare what we call a baseline test, which is a pre-season or test done early in the year in the normal state, 
with tests done after the injury and see how things have changed in terms of criti critical parameters such as reaction time, memory and information processing speed. And then very, very importantly, something I was discussing with Louis yesterday is the education component. If people don't understand why concussion is important, why you need protocols in place, then we're going to continue to mismanage it as that rugby league player was mismanaged in that video that we saw. If you have an education program in place that targets the layperson, the athlete, and the clinician, then everybody is on the same page and understands what we're trying to do, which is actually to get the patient back on the field, not to keep them off the field, but to time, the, the, time it correctly. So in 2017, you know, we don't just have that simple definition anymore. We've got a much broader definition. We've got a spectrum of symptoms. We've got computerized tests. We've got serial clinical assessments. We've got physicians and neurologists involved, neuropsychologists, some scans, hospital management, home management, no defined return to ti play time frame. So, so really, that's what I mean by a lot of clutter. It almost seems more complicated than it was before. It was easy before. If it was con lost consciousness, you, 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 you kept them out for two weeks or whatever, and that was the end of the story. But now it's much more difficult. And I like to look at it in this way. So this is a brain here, as you can see. But it's not any brain. Okay, it belonged to this man here. So he had a lot of wise things to say, Einstein. And one of the quotes of his that I like is that, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. And I like this in this context, not only because of his fantastic brain, because concussion is a mystery. And we need to try and delve through that mystery and try and have a more systematic approach to make it easier for people like me, um, who are not uh, as clever as, as some of you out there. So, so that's really what I'm going to try and do in the, today and, and tomorrow is to try and simplify it. So let's have a look at where we are in terms of consensus. Uh, and as I say, this will be published in the next two weeks. So some of the next few slides are a bit dry because I've actually cut and pasted some stuff directly out of the consensus statement just to show you what's up to date. So I will ask, if you don't mind, that you don't tweet some of the next slides because they, they actually haven't been published yet. They will be out in the next couple of weeks, um, if you don't mind. So the 2017 guidelines which will come out uh, are really building on the previous four consensus statements that I mentioned. And they've developed what we regard as a conceptual understanding of sport-related concussion using an expert consensus-based approach. So what happened was the experts, about 30 experts were uh, identified. We, we looked at 12 key aspects of concussion diagnosis and management and performed systematic reviews on these 12 topics. Nearly 60,000 papers uh, covering the topic of sports-related concussion were reviewed as part of this process. So it really was quite systematic and quite extensive. And really the aim is to involve, evolve our understanding of concussion and individual management and return to play decisions uh, and that the clin clinician really remains central to this whole process. Also important as part of this Berlin meeting were that the experts from other areas in traumatic brain injury, not just sport, that were integrated into the program. So this is what the edition of BJSM will look like um, in the next few uh, couple of weeks that comes out uh, and it's going to cover the topics under these 11 headings uh, which really will look in a quite a systematic way at how we manage concussion. So let's look at some of those. Well first thing is the definition. Again I'm not going to labor this. I've discussed it. It's a traumatic brain injury. Impulsive forces transmitted to the head resulting in rapid onset of short-lived impairment with signs and symptoms that uh, usually resolve but may evolve over a period of time, results in neuropathological changes and manifests as a functional disturbance. Interestingly, only about 10% of cases of concussion are associated with a loss of consciousness. So if you only regard loss of consciousness as the main sign, you're going to miss 90% of cases of functional disturbance of the brain. This issue, this issue of removing the athlete is key. So the mantra in rugby is recognize and remove. 
So if you even suspect a concussion, you remove the player from the field. That protects his or her brain immediately. If you allow them to play on, then you, result, you, you, you allow them to face the consequences of, at the very least, prolonged symptoms, but potentially severe neurological Ill injury. One of the things that was found to be of use in our review of the literature is sideline video review. So if you were on the side of the field at that rugby league game, you might have missed, so if you were on the other side of the field, you might have missed that player going down, so as a, uh, as a case in point. If you're able to watch it on video, on television, as we did there, you can see quite clearly that before he hit the ground, he was unconscious. He had a limp body. And so the use of sideline video review, obviously more in the professional sporting realm, has made a big difference to sports like NFL and uh, rugby. Soccer has tremendous uh, television coverage, and there's really no excuse for missing incidents of, of concussion where they take place in a, pro uh, a professional environment. Once that player is removed, they undergo what we call a multimodal assessment. Because concussion is a functional injury, you cannot diagnose it on one particular parameter alone. So you can't just use physical signs or loss of balance or loss of memory or loss of consciousness. You need to look at a whole lot of modalities. So there's a tool called the Sports Concussion Assessment Tool, and it's in its fifth, fifth version now, and that is a very useful protocol that if anyone is managing concussion, you need to become f familiar with, and that's going to be the topic of our workshop tomorrow is to look at those protocols, and as a sports clinician, physiotherapist, whatever, that's something you need in your toolbox to be able to use. And that new version, again, will come out in the next uh, two weeks, and that t takes at least 10 minutes, which makes a little bit of a mockery of Sports such as soccer, where they expect the clinician on the field to have a look at a player and make a decision then. So ideally, sports should allow a process where that player can come off the field and be assessed properly. And that process looks at what's happened on the field. It looks at the red flags, which may indicate more severe injury. It looks at all of their symptoms. It's a brief neurological screen. It incorporates a balance component. Uh, and it has some verbal cognitive tests which give very good information in a period of 10 to 15 minutes as to what's happened with that player. If you have baseline information, you can compare it to that. And if you don't, in any case, you can use it to mo monitor that player in serial evaluations in the days to come. And that is important, that re-evaluation process. So it's not just evaluation, it's re-evaluation. You take a comprehensive history, a neurological examination, you determine the clinical status and whether they've improved or deteriorated since the last time. And that helps uh, inform your decisions as to what to do. There are criteria which determine whether you should send that patient for imaging. And we had some discussions with the imaging department here yesterday. And the key issue is that most of these don't require imaging because the imaging doesn't offer us much. You image if you're worried about more serious structural brain injury. That neuropsychological testing doesn't necessarily have to be computerized. There's useful verbal tests which can be used. Obviously, one of the challenges in this environment are the cultural and language issues, and that's something that we have to have some discussions about as to how we get around those. But certainly, your protocols will have to be customized. The key intervention is really rest in concussion. There's no magic pill. No magic pill which is going to allow you to recover. And that rest needs to be both physical and cognitive. Interestingly, the research is showing that it doesn't have to be complete rest physically. And that actually some uh, integrated exercise and rehabilitation can help, as can gradual reintroduction of some cognitive stimuli as well. So it doesn't have to be complete rest as long as the rest is below the level that exacerbates their cognitive and physical symptoms. So we do it just enough so that they don't feel a lot worse, and that allows them to get back. One of the key concepts that's come out of this last consensus meeting is that of rehabilitation, and that will interest the physiotherapists uh, and if there's psychologists among you, amongst you as well. So we don't just sit back and watch these concussions and hope they get better. We intervene. We manage their symptoms. A lot of their symptoms may be cervicogenic, so we treat their necks. A lot of them might be vestibular, so we stimulate them. We, we gradually try and stimulate the ocular vestibular uh, systems and circuits. 
we introduce gradual rehabilitation and exercise and gradually reintroduce them into the cognitive environment so they can get back to school and learning and work and sport as well. You need to have a referral system. Okay, so you need to have someone who manages, and that's usually the sports clinician, but you need the therapists involved, you need the psychologists. For those more severe cases, you will need imaging and neurological and neurosurgical support as well. So that's very, very important. So you really need to look at a, a multidisciplinary collaborative setting in terms of managing the concussion. Recovery. Okay, uh, the key issue is that the greater the number and severity of the symptoms, the slower the recovery. So the more florid the presentation initially, the slower they are to, be, uh, to, to recover. There are other what we call modifying factors, factors that mitigate uh, a rapid uh, recovery. So to give you an example, if you have a 20-year-old who sustains a first concussion and they have three or four fairly low-grade symptoms, they're going to really recover in a very uncomplicated way, usually. If you have a 14-year-old who has attention deficit disorder, a family history of depression, they're on treatment for their ADHD, okay, and they might have had encephalitis as a child. They've got four or five mitigating factors or modifying factors which say, listen, this brain is a little bit more vulnerable. And there's no scorecard for that. It's really a clinical impression that one has, but we need to take those into consideration when managing these patients. Obviously, the most important to a sports person is their return to sport, and I've cut and pasted that uh, protocol, which is obviously a little bit small as it presents, but the fact is it's a stepwise approach. And once their symptoms are clearing, we start them on this return to play process, where they're introduced firstly to daily activities, and then to gradual, uh, gradually increasing intensities of exercise, eventually to simula simulating their specific sport, and then getting them back into semi-contact and contact. So it's a graduated process that allows them to adapt along the way, and also allows you to monitor whether they're coping at each stage, rather than going from a period of total rest to a period of full contact again. Importantly, the children in particular have to be progressed back into school and again that should be a graduated process where they start at home with gradual reintroduction of reading and screen time and that progresses into getting them to do more homework and an introduction into school work with, with accommodations and then eventually into full school. This process of, of uh, concussion needs to be customized. So it's not so much elite versus non-elite athletes. We try and apply the same principles across the board. So a clinic like this wouldn't have to modify their protocols according to the level of athlete. You do need to modify it according to the, to the age of the athlete. And children take longer to recover. The developing brain seems to be affected more. So age-specific guidelines are important. I think it's very important if you're a school or you're a clinic to have a concussion policy in place. And that's something that needs to be uh, worked on. And eventually the whole point, of course, is to return them to school and to sport. As I mentioned earlier on, this is really the key or hot topic in, in sports medicine and concussion medicine in particular. And that is the issue of residual effects. If you have several concussions, if you have several blows which maybe you weren't recognized as concussion, later on in life, does it count against you? May it manifest with some chronic neurological condition which will affect you negatively? And that is an issue that's under a lot of debate. It's undergoing a lot of research. Unfortunately, there's a big void between the concussions which happen here and the picture we're seeing on pathological post-mortem slides there. And we don't know what's happening in between. But this association has been picked up and we need to fill in a lot of gaps and it's certainly an important part of it. And then finally, ideally, one would want to try and avoid suffering concussions. Now, you know, in life, you're going to fall off ladders, you're going to, kids are going to fall in the playground, fall off bicycles, skateboards, etc. You're not going to prevent all, of it, all injuries. But we can work on reducing risk and I think that's very, very important. So in certain sports like skiing and snowboarding and cycling, helmets have been shown to be beneficial, but not in rugby and in American football. 
Mouth guards are important in terms of orofacial protection, but uh, you know, may or may not produce a, a protective effect in concussion. Very importantly are the rules. So what you'll see is sports changing their rules. Rugby's just changed the enforcement of their tackling law to try and prevent or reduce the number of head contacts. A few years ago, soccer, football introduced a change to the heading law, the contest in the air law, so that you have to keep your elbows down to try and reduce those injuries, and the same with body checking and ice hockey. So those are the, the most important aspects in terms of reducing risk. I mentioned a little bit about concussion being a treatable condition, and this is a really a, a very important evolving science as well. So what we need to intervene in, we're still working on, but certainly ocular, vestibular, cervicogenic aspects are becoming important. And there is evidence to say, yes, if we intervene, if we look at those patients who we've treated and those who we've left alone, those who we've instituted protocols on seem to do better. As long as there's a multimodal approach, there's an introduction of manual therapy and exercise components, okay, and specific exercises for that patient that helps them in their particular areas that they need. And again, these are just some papers uh, showing you recently published papers that multimodal impairment-based phys impairment physiotherapy for post-concussion syndrome, particularly in young athletes, can be beneficial. I think we're all familiar with the tendinopathy uh, model of, of rehabilitation and the concept of mechanotransduction in terms of why we use exercise to rehabilitate tendons. And I see a similar thing with neurological rehabilitation and recovery. That by gradually exposing the neurological network to a degree of stress, you actually allow for adaptation. And I think that's a concept that we're coming to grips with and incorporating. If you look at the ocular motor circuits, they're very, very complex, of the most complex in the brain. And by stimulating these, you stimulate a number of circuits in the brain. Uh, and that allows for, firstly, more significant assessment of the, of the concussed player, but also for rehabilitating a very extensive network of pathways. And I think this is an exciting area for development, particularly at a clinic like this. I always maintain at the back of my mind that not, only, not every headache associated with sport is a concussion, so you've got to remember the differential diagnoses, the potential bleeds, migraines, seizure disorders, cervicogenic causes, vestibular causes, vascular causes. There's a number of causes that may be associated with sport that aren't concussion related. And sometimes when we're so focused on a particular topic, we forget about the other potential differentials, which we shouldn't do. Again, if you don't tweet this, I'd appreciate it. It's a slide I've credited Dr. Paul McClory there, but it's something I'm going to cover in tomorrow's lecture because I think it very nicely encapsulates the complexity of concussion. So these are the areas that we've got to look at in any vulnerable patient uh, who's potentially suffered a concussion. We've got to look at the neurological aspects, the cognitive aspects, potential mood manifestations, behavior changes, automatic, autonomic manifestations, sleep and hormonal, cervical and vestibular. Each of those needs a very specific response. It needs clinicians working uh, in concert together to try and integrate their rehabilitation protocols to get this player the, the, the best possible outcome uh, and to address these. One of the things that I find in clinical practice is that taking a blow to the head often results in the manifestation of neurological and psychological issues that were perhaps bun bubbling under at a, at a subclinical level. So the, the young person who perhaps had attention deficit disorder, which wasn't uh, picked up or treated, suddenly has real significant difficulties learning. The person who perhaps had subclinical depression suddenly manifests which might, with much more overt depressive symptoms. And you've got to look out for these and be able to treat them and just not fob them off as saying it's concussion, it's rest, we'll sort it out. So I think we've got to be very, very careful of making sure we understand the com potential complexities of concussion. I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow, but I just want to touch on the concept of the Sports Concussion Center, which is really an area that facilitates the multimodal management of concussion, and that's something that perhaps you might look at uh, 
setting up here. Evidence-based, best practice, competent healthcare professionals who understand concussion, the resources for intervention that's cost-efficient and user-friendly, supported by it, uh, a good educational program. World Rugby has introduced this concept of an advanced care setting, which really incorporates the highest level of care for athletes, and that's something that you should be striving for here. Uh, and those are the types of, of facilities you might require. Um, you know, the exercise and physical therapists are playing an increasing role. The sports physician uni usually manages the process and may require other specialties uh, to input as well. Well, what about technology in trying to influence how we diagnose concussion? And you will have picked up on this in some of the literature. Um, sensors, impact sensors, accelerometers, etc. They, they're certainly commercially available, and it's one of those areas there where the commercial availability has outstripped the science. Now, having reviewed these as part of my paper for the consensus meeting, I can tell you that the science is quite well behind. In other words, these are not ready to be incorporated into um, regular concussion management. And the reasons for that is that although they detect the impacts, it, it really depends a lot on where that impact takes place. So it really picks up the impacts close to the sensor, but not really correlate, is not co well correlated with the impacts that are transmitted to the brain. So we don't yet know what the thresholds are that we should be looking at in terms of the, the level of impact that we should regard as serious. We don't know whether it's picking up just direct impacts or the rotational impacts as well. And the interpretation of the data are, are very difficult. So, you know, to be able to say, well, it's picked up this particular level of impact. What do we do about it? We haven't worked that out yet. It's also potentially very dangerous because if you've got a commercially available uh, system, you may have coaches, parents sitting with monitors and uh, iPads on the side of the field trying to make decisions. So they're certainly not ready yet for incorporation into standard care. Wouldn't it be nice if we had some pharmacological intervention? So someone comes in with a concussion and we can give them a pill and make them better. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, which doesn't mean you can't help them feel better. We can treat them symptomatically. We can treat the headaches. We can treat insomnia. We can treat prolonged mood changes. And we can pr uh, treat prolonged poor concentration. But our pharmacological intervention, unfortunately, at the moment is all reactive. What's postulated is we might be able to alter the pathogenesis and those el electrophysiological changes I spoke about. Can we influence the cascade of neurochemical, ionic, and metabolic changes eventually? And these have been postulated as potential interventions. I'm not going to go through them in detail because none of them have really been proven yet. But this is an area of research that's taking place as to whether we can affect uh, the, the prognosis of our concussed athletes, but none have been proven at this stage. Prevention, we mentioned a little bit about the helmets, and there's a, a very high-level NFL helmet, but even that won't help prevent uh, concussion. One of the areas I'm particularly interested in, again, it brings the therapists into play, is neck strengthening. There's a good study also about to be published uh, from a rugby group in Bath in England, which looked at exercise interventions in preventing a number of rugby injuries. And one of the most significant findings was neck strengthening in preventing concussion. Interesting in that study is that there was a dose response. So if they had to do it three times a week to get the, uh, to get the, the most effect in terms of preventing concussion. Uh, so that's an area that's, that I think is, is useful. What about mouth guards? Well, it's postulated that mouth guards might absorb shock distract the temporomandibular joint and result in neck tensioning as a result of biting down. Again, the studies uh, and the research are really uh, a little bit uh, controversial. Some prove it, some don't prove it, um, but uh, some, you know, the evidence is really there for orofacial injuries, but in a nutshell, not there yet for concussive injuries. Uh, but certainly, it's certainly worth wearing uh, a good mouth guard to protect yourself in, in most contact and collision sports. Uh, the neck we've mentioned a little bit about, and I'm going to end off by talking a little bit about this concept of chronic sequelae and concussion. Um, so not funny, but uh, funny nevertheless. 
Uh, and what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about repeated concussions and what's termed subconcussive blows leading to permanent structural brain damage. Early on, that might present with slurring, dysarthria, pyramidal signs, disequilibrium, behavioral changes, and later significant cognitive disturbances, which may predominate. So uh, on the pathologist slide, these are the changes which are seen. Hyperphosphorylated areas of tau protein disposition in a very particular perivascular distribution. Um, and there's loss of ex uh, exonal um, mass, abnormal protein aggregation, and that manifests clinically uh, with a number of those presentations. Or if you're a cynic, you might say, well, you know, it might not be the repeated concussions. It might just be that these guys were prone to depression anyway, that a large proportion of the population does develop dementia anyway. There may be other comorbidities and mental health issues. A lot of these sportsmen use alcohol and illicit drugs. Uh, some of them suffer uh, assault and uh, impacts from other, other areas of their lives. Uh, and so the jury is really out. I think it's a distinct pathological diagnosis, but we're not yet sure how much sport contributes to getting there. It's really an area to be watched out for. So there may be some ultrastructural functional disturbances, um, and there are some imaging techniques which are proving promising, but not yet conclusive in trying to determine you know, what, what these changes are. So in summary, we really are develop, uh, in, in the midst of a very significantly evolving science. Unfortunately, because of the public health issues and the prominence given to this, the media attention and the cultural awareness has far outstripped uh, where we are from a scientific point of view. And that's a dangerous situation for clinicians because the public is hyper aware of what they perceive to be a really significant problem. Uh, and yet science doesn't have all the answers. So we must just be very wary about, uh, you know, jumping to too many conclusions. Use the science we have, which is what the, the consensus protocols are about. And hopefully we'll have some answers uh, in the coming years in terms of further diagnostic markers and certain clinical implications and, and interventions. Um, starting from the conference we've just had. So I hope you've had a little bit of input that's cleared some of the clutter, cleared some of the confusion, that you understand that we do have clinical protocols based on international guidelines, that the key message is to recognize, remove and refer, and really to take consensus uh, from what we understand it to be and hopefully implement it into a clinical setting uh, in Aspatar and other environments. Thank you very much for your attention.